The oceans have been playing a critical role in maintaining the CO2 levels in the atmosphere because they've been responsible for taking up for about 30 to 40 percent of all the carbon dioxide that we've emitted since the start of the Industrial Revolution. But the trade-off of this is the fact is that carbon dioxide is an acidic gas, and so the more that's taken up into the, into the ocean, the more it shifts the pH of the ocean, and the pH being a measure of the acidity or alkalinity. Now, at the moment, the, the oceans are pretty alkaline, but the more um, CO2 that goes into it, they shift towards becoming slightly more acidic. And this has impacts for, for not only the chemistry of the ocean, but the biology of the ocean. And this is the process we call ocean acidification. What's happening is that basically because you're getting all these, uh, this acidic gas going in, you're getting more hydrogen ions in the water. Now the, the ocean's been pretty much balanced for hundreds of thousands of years because it has this very clever buffering system that when this, it gets this extra acid coming in, it basically throws carbonate at it. So the carbonate reacts with the hydrogen ions and that keeps things very stable. But the, the trouble is at the moment that we're putting up so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and so into the ocean that the oceans can't keep up. They can't supply enough carbonate and so what's happening is that basically the carbonate in the ocean is decreasing with time. And that's going to have a knock-on effect for all the organisms that use carbonate in things like shells and in their body structures. They're going to have to adjust their metabolism to actually get to work harder to get more carbonate into their shells. And that affects all other things like growth, fecundity and reproduction. Certain aspects of the plankton are, also have carbonate shells. Um, we're very interested, for example, in a phytoplankton called the coccolithophores, which are these beautiful kind of um, like a sphere, a floating sphere made up of lots of little carbonate or chalk plates. And of course, the fact is that in a, in a, in a future world where there's higher CO2, they will have trouble maintaining these plates and then their, foot, their body shells. And so this will, once again, if they have to put more effort and more work into maintaining their shells, this will feed in up the food chain and the fact that there'll be less of them around, less food for the organisms further up the food chain. But the, the best example, I think, and one is what is kind of, we kind of regard as a bit of a canary in the coal mine in terms of ocean acidification, is um, the effect of acidification on a group of plankton called pteropods. Uh, these are better known as kind of sea butterflies because when they, they swim in the water, they put kind of little, little angels bobbing in position to maintain, uh, maintain their position in the, the surface ocean. And uh, these are an important part of the food chain in the fact that they, they're the food uh, food item for things such as um, fish and even whales, for example. Some place in the Southern Ocean, they're even more important than um, krill. And so anyway, they have, um, they have a carbonate shell and um, experiments have shown that, uh, that really that they, even if you put them in a pH, which is predicted for the end of the, this century, their, their shells start to dissolve within a day or two. So it's that serious. So it's particularly because they have a type of carbonate that's particularly susceptible to this uh, dissolution. Basically, the fact is that in a higher CO2 world, this type of carbonate will basically prefers to be in a dissolved phase rather than a solid phase. And so that, that organism has got to work really hard to maintain a solid shell made, made of this type of carbonate. NIWA runs a biophysical mooring, in fact two stations either side of the Chatham Rise, one in subtropical water and one in sub-Antarctic water. And here we have a series of uh, what we call sediment traps. These are just basically effectively large funnels that sit in the water and they pick up all the material that falls down. And we get a continuous time record of all the material that's falling through there. And so we can look at how things change over a year or between years. And so we not only look at the amount of material, but we look at the type of material, and we can look at the shells of these organisms. So for example, in the case of pteropods, we count the number of shells that are there. And what we're seeing, particularly in the colder sub-Antarctic waters, is a real decline in these pteropod shells with time. So over the last three or four years, the numbers have dropped down dramatically. Now, we don't know at the moment, but this could be related to the fact that of ocean acidification. The fact is that obviously it's increasing with time and the pH of that water is dropping and the carbonate availability is decreasing. So the decrease in their numbers could reflect ocean acidification. But our research is broader than that. We're looking at, at different, uh, uh, many different types of organisms that use carbonate in their shell. And we're, we're not only actually looking at their distribution, we're trying to develop methods which will allow us to actually uh, look at them remotely the nice thing about having a carbonate shell, particularly for those smaller plankton like coccolithophores, is that it shows up nicely in satellite images. You get a very strong reflectance, a backscatter of the light, and you can see in a satellite image of, uh, of round New Zealand, you can see these bright turquoise spots where these cooked uh, coccolithophore blooms 
pattern in surface waters. And so we can use that as a method of, of seeing just where they are, how frequent they are, and whether they're increasing or declining. For um, the effect of ocean acidification on um, organisms that don't use carbonate, we're looking at other things. For example, um, we're very interested in the role of bacteria. Uh, and um, Now, bacteria are incredibly important. They basically break down all the particles in the ocean. They break it all down back to very small small sort of units of nutrients and so they support the rest of the phytoplankton in that in that regard and so they play a, they're a critical part in the food chain and we're interested in that actual the role they play in breaking down this material and one of the aspects is that it might actually affect their enzyme action so obviously it's the enzymes the bacterial enzymes that are breaking down this material and enzymes always have an optimum condition which they work in so they have an optimum temperature and an optimum pH and what we've actually found, and this is consistent with what other people in the world have found, uh, the few people who've looked at this, is that actually the enzymes are increasing their activity under high CO2, which means this material will be breaking down faster. That sounds like a good thing, the fact that, these, you know, that we're actually optimizing it, but actually it's not, because what it means is that the more of this material that's broken down by the bacteria in the surface ocean, the less of it is sinking into the deep ocean. What we want is for the ocean to actually uh, take up more carbon dioxide and one way of it doing that is transferring it from the surface down to the deep water very quickly. So if the bacteria start breaking down things more rapidly, less of that material will sink down into the ocean. And so ultimately the effect of this will be the ocean carbon dioxide sink will decrease. So more remain in the atmosphere and so more global warming and more ocean acidification of the surface waters.